It'll pay government to give those people who are suffering innocence, justice and liberty. If not, I'll be compelled to show some colonial stratagem which will open the eyes of not only the Victorian police and inhabitants, but also the whole British army. And no doubt they'll acknowledge their hounds were barking at the wrong stump, and that Fitzpatrick will be the cause of greater slaughter to the Union Jack than St. Patrick was to the snakes and toads in Ireland. This is the strange history of Edward Ned Kelly. This is Ned Kelly's boyhood home in Beveridge, Victoria. No, not that Beveridge. Beveridge. His dad, Red Kelly, who was originally brought to Australia from Ireland as a convict for stealing two pigs, bought this land after getting rich digging for gold. Although Ned's family didn't do too well in Beveridge, Beveridge so his father started drinking beverages. No, not that beverage, this beverage. At age 11, Ned saved a young boy from drowning in a creek and was awarded this green sash in recognition of his bravery. He wore this very sash under his armour during his final showdown with police in 1880. It remains stained with his blood. We'll get to that later. In December 1866, Ned's father, Red, was fined for being drunk and disorderly. Badly affected by alcohol, he died soon after. Red was dead. In 1868, Ned's Uncle Jim was convicted of arson after setting fire to their rented premises. Uncle Jim was sentenced to death, but later this was commuted to 15 years hard labour. Ned's mother Ellen was unable to make enough money farming, so she rented out rooms to passing travellers, you know, like old-style Airbnb, and she also sold illegal beverages. Yeah, you know what I mean. When Ned was 14 years old, he met Irish-born bushranger Harry Power, who has been described as Ned Kelly's bushranging mentor. They had a plan to steal horses from a nearby property, but were shot at by the owner, so Ned temporarily abandoned bushranging as it seemed a bit too deadly for his liking. In 1869, Ned had his first brush with the law over an altercation between him and a Chinese pig and fowl dealer named Ah Fook. According to Fook, Ned brandished a long stick and declared himself a bush ranger before robbing him. Ned stated in court that Fook had abused his sister Annie and then beat Ned with a stick after he came to his sister's defence. Other witnesses corroborated Ned's story and the charges were dropped. Ned reconciled with Harry Power in March 1870, and over the next month, the pair committed a series of armed robberies. By the end of April, police had captured and confined Ned to Beechworth Jail. He fronted court on three separate robbery charges, only one of which stuck. He was transferred to a small town to face court, but no evidence was produced, and he was released a free man. In June 1870, while resting in a mountainside shelter, Harry was captured by a police search party. Following his arrest, word spread that Ned had informed on him. Ned denied the rumour. However, Harry always believed that Ned was responsible for the betrayal. Over the next few years, Ned was involved in a few more crimes. He helped his friend deliver an indecent note in which two calves' testicles had been wrapped, resulting in Ned punching someone in the nose, leading to his arrest. He was sentenced to six months' hard labour. In April 1871, horsebreaker Isaiah Wild Wright arrived in town to see his friend Alex Gunn, who was married to Ned's older sister. Wright was riding a chestnut mare, which he had borrowed without telling the owner. Ned came into possession of the horse, and while riding back into town, he was intercepted by a police officer, pistol whipped into submission, and was charged with horse stealing, which was later downgraded to feloniously receiving a horse. He received three years hard labour. Wild Wright only received 18 months for illegal use of a horse. In August 1874, to settle the score with Wright over the chestnut mare, Ned fought him in a bare-knuckle boxing match. Ned won after 20 rounds and was declared the unofficial boxing champion of the district. In September 1870, Ned was arrested for riding over a footpath while drunk. While being escorted to court, he got into a fight with the four police officers, one of which was Constable Alex Fitzpatrick. Ned was found guilty and was fined and released. 
Ned had earlier stolen a number of horses, which were later listed as stolen, and the police began an investigation. In March 1878, warrants for the arrest of Ned and his younger brother Dan were sworn. In April 1878, Constable Fitzpatrick headed to the Kelly house, arrested Dan, but then got ambushed by Ned, who rushed in through the front door. Fired a shot at Fitzpatrick with a revolver, but missed. Kelly's mother hit Fitzpatrick over the head with a shovel. There was a struggle. Two more shots were fired. Fitzpatrick was wounded in the wrist. Brother Dan disarmed Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick fainted, regained consciousness and made a deal with Ned and was allowed to leave. But he found that two horsemen were pursuing. He managed to escape and reported the affair to his superior officer. Ned's mother, Ellen Kelly, was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting attempted murder. She received three years of hard labour. The sentence was considered harsh, even by people who had no cause to be Kelly sympathisers, especially as she was nursing a newborn baby. Soon after, Ned, Dan, their mates Joe Byrne and Steve Hart, the so-called Kelly Gang, went into hiding in the Wombat Ranges. They made money by finding gold in the creek and distilling illegal beverages. In October 1878, police got word that the Kelly Gang was hiding out in the Wombat Ranges and dispatched a team of mounted police. Sergeant Kennedy, together with Constables Scanlon, Lonigan and McIntyre. Kennedy and Scanlon went out scouting leaving McIntyre McIntyre and Lonigan back at camp. At around 5pm, 26 October 1878, the Kelly gang entered camp. Lonigan tried to seek cover and draw his revolver, but was shot dead by Ned. The Kelly gang questioned McIntyre and armed themselves with the policemen's shotguns and revolvers. At around 5.30pm, Kennedy and Scanlon returned on horseback with the Kelly gang lying in wait. Kennedy tried to unclip his holster and shots were fired by the gang. Scanlon dismounted and was shot while trying to unsling his rifle, dying soon after. Kennedy retreated into the bush with Ned and Dan pursuing him for almost a mile, exchanging gunfire with the sergeant until finally he was fatally shot in the chest by Ned with a shotgun at very close range. McIntyre managed to escape by mounting Kennedy's horse. He reached the local police station the following day and a search party quickly found the bodies of Lonigan and Scanlon. News of the police murders led to widespread fear of the Kelly gang. On 28th of October, the government of Victoria announced a substantial reward for their arrest. On 31st of October 1878, the Victorian Parliament passed the Felons Apprehension Act, giving the bushrangers until the 12th of November to surrender themselves. When they failed to do so, on the 15th of November, the four members of the Kelly gang were declared outlaws, which meant that anybody could kill them on sight without challenge if they were armed, or if there was a reasonable suspicion that they were armed. In January of 1879, police used the Felons Apprehension Act to arrest 30 presumed Kelly sympathisers for aiding the outlaws, 23 of which were remanded in custody. The imprisonment of these people without trial swung public sympathy away from the police. There was widespread condemnation of the denial of the civil liberties of those detained, although this didn't necessarily mean there was widespread support for the outlaws. During February of 1879, the gang raided the Gerald Derry police barracks, locked the policemen up, held the officer's wife and young children hostage, prepared for a bank robbery by dressing up in police uniforms, threatened to burn down the barracks, held up the hotel, taking the hotel staff and patrons hostage, held up the bank, stealing cash as well as jewellery, burnt the deeds, mortgages and securities from the safe because the bloody banks are crushing the life's blood out of the poor struggling man, took the bank staff and several patrons prisoner, held up the post office, destroyed the Morse code machine and used axes to bring down the telephone poles and wires. Ned also tried to get his 56-page manifesto letter printed at the local newspaper. However, the newspaper owner had already escaped and fled town. The gang returned to the police barracks, seized the police horses and weapons, threatened the policeman's wife, and then rode out of town. They were not seen again by the police until 17 months later. In response to the Gerald Derry raid, a massive reward was offered for the capture of the outlaws, dead or alive. 
Troopers were sent out to hunt down the gang. Even this native police unit was sent in from Queensland to help capture the ever-elusive criminals. But by mid-1880, there was still no sign of them. Kelly gang associate Aaron Sherritt, a lifelong friend of Joe Byrne, ended up becoming a police informant, but many police suspected he was a double agent and didn't trust him. Unfortunately for Aaron, Joe Byrne's mother stumbled upon a police camp while gathering kindling and spotted him talking with police. She now knew that he was an informer, and I guess you know what happens to snitches. On the night of 26th of June 1880, Aaron was at home with his pregnant wife and a few police officers when he heard his neighbour calling out for him at the back door. The neighbour had been handcuffed and held hostage by Joe and Dan. When Aaron answered the door, he was shot at point-blank range with a double-barrel shotgun. I guess you already knew that was going to happen. After a small siege that lasted a couple of hours, the outlaws managed to escape back into the bush. The gang knew the police would send reinforcements by train, so Ned forced two line repairers to damage the track at Glen Rowan in a plot to derail the police special train, but the plan failed. But the gang had a plan B. They had secretly been crafting bulletproof armour from stolen agricultural metal, with each suit coming in at around 97 pounds, making them very cumbersome to wear. At around 3am on the morning of 28th of June 1880, news came in that the police train had arrived. The outlaws donned their armour, positioned themselves in the shadow of the veranda in the front of the hotel, and opened fire when the police were about 30 yards away in the moonlight. Although the Victorian police were told about the armour three times before, they dismissed the information as nonsense and an impossibility. None of the police realised the gang were wearing armour during the shootout. In the mist and dim light of dawn, the size and shape of Ned's armour made a number of policemen even question whether he was human, and his apparent invulnerability caused onlookers to react with superstitious awe. Some police were completely astonished and could not understand what the object they were firing at was. One constable recalled firing at him point blank and hitting him straight in the body, but there was no use firing as he couldn't be hurt. The gun battle lasted under half an hour. Joe died from a stray bullet that hit his groin through a small gap in his armour. Ned was eventually taken down with two shotgun blasts to his unprotected legs and thighs. Dan and Steve were still in the hotel by Monday afternoon, so the police decided to burn them out. While the building was burning, police recovered the body of Joe from the hotel bar, and at around 4pm, after the fire died out, the badly burnt bodies of Dan and Steve were also recovered. The police had won. The Kelly gang was no more. Kelly stood trial in October 1880 and was found guilty of the willful murder of Constable Lonigan. He was sentenced to death by hanging. This is the last photo of the 25-year-old Edward Ned Kelly, taken on 10th of November 1880 at the old Melbourne jail. The next morning, 11th of November, the governor of the jail informed Ned that the hour of execution had been fixed at 10am. Ned's leg irons were removed, and as he was led out by warders accompanied by the chaplain, he commented on the beauty of the flowers when passing the jail's garden. As the noose was placed around his neck, his last words were, Ah well, I suppose it has come to this. Such is life. And that's the strange history of Australian bushranger Edward Ned Kelly. Mm.